Uh, okay, today we're going to start uh, doing some more heavy stuff, things that are more hardcore. I mean, we talked about, wait a minute, we talked about all this stuff until now was pretty much similar to what it, it, you can see in other languages. So we talked about uh, if conditional statements and uh, Boolean expressions, and we talked about loops and all that. But now we're really going to dive into something a little deeper. In, and there are similarities still to other languages that you might encounter, but they're not quite exactly the same because JavaScript has its own rules. Not just the fact that you have data types that are completely typeless, but also the fact that things work differently. So I made this slide. I don't know if you're aware of the, uh, the uncanny valley. That's a the value of uncanny is something that uh, combines robotics and psychology. It's about the fact that if you see something that looks, let's say, not completely human, um, then it could be okay to you. I mean, for example, if we take this R2D2, um, he's not human at all. He doesn't look like human. He's a very cute little robot, okay? Um, and then we can go up the scale to something more human, like a more human robot, but still you know that this thing is not even trying to be human at all. And then what happens, this is the, the, the scale upwards, is familiarity, how much you, it seems familiar to you and safe. Um, and this is how much the robot looks like a human. So we're going up the scale, and then at some point, when the robot is almost human, but it has a little bit of twist in it. It's not fully human. Then we get these creepy Japanese robots that look almost humans. Um, and this thing has a big fall, the value of uncanny. People get creeped out. And this is something that people who develop robots that want to make them more humanoids, they, they have to work hard to, to make them more, to have facial expressions and eyes and facial uh, muscles and all that. And there's a big drop here in the, in the familiarity of how things look. And that's what creepiness actually works on. And then when you get more, um, more human than that, you pass this valley. Then you have robots like this uh, Dolores from Westworld who looks completely human, but doesn't mean she can't kill you, of course. Um, and she will. But uh, what I put, wh why did I put this here? Because also what we have, what we've seen so far, is things that are going upwards when we're talking about JavaScript. And we talked about things, okay, okay there's the, this far end here near R2D2. I put uh, hello world in a language called BrainFuck. And that's what it looks like. It's all symbols. And it's completely not, not doesn't look like anything. And then I put hello world in Pascal which looks a little bit more familiar to us. But then we have JavaScript, and here we'll talk about today about functions and objects in JavaScript. And I think that um, there's, a, there's a drop here. There's a value that um, things work a little bit different. And then we go up to something that looks a bit like, like more like C Sharp. So this is a hello world in C Sharp. So it's not exactly accurate and scientific, what I'm doing. But this graph is, and this is. Uh, something nice to, to know. So with this, we're going to start. Um, actually, I can do it from here. We're going to start with functions. OK. That's our first topic of the day. Are most of the functions trees? Trees? Yes, they are trees. Everything is trees. <laughs> most, of the most of the humans are trees. I'm a tree. Uh, well, a good function will be made of wood and not plastic, but that's up to you. OK, let's start. Uh, no, let's go next. Works? OK. So um, the, gro the global uh, idea of what a function is and how it works should be familiar to you. So a function is a piece of building block in your code, some kind of black box that has to do something. Um, if we're talking about uh, what we uh, refer to on projects as, for example, unit tests, usually a unit is a function. So a piece of work, or let's say, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to confuse it with um, things from, 
I don't want to confuse it with, I'll think of the word, with patterns like uh, element of work. I forgot the name. Never mind. Forget what I just said. Functions are one block of work that should be theoretically carrying out a specific task. Um, it can take parameters and return a value, but it doesn't have to. And usually they would be, what I, what I mentioned, should be something, if you, if you plan your code correctly, they should do a specific thing. They should be named with a name that would imply what they're trying to do. And mm, they should do what they're supposed to. I mean, it should be as simple as that function has a specific function that it tries to carry out. The name should imply what it is. It should have matching parameters and return the value. Of course, in the real world of bugs, this doesn't always work exactly like that, but that's the intention. Why would you use function? This is uh, the base of function is, of course, modularity. Um, split your problems into smaller problems and smaller problems um, until you, you find a point which is, let's say, the smallest piece of work that you want to perform and or something which is functionally correct to be cut into your own function, then you have your um, work split. Um, um, it's all about modularity. You split your code into um, working black boxes and carry on your work like that. Um, yeah, all these things here are true, uh, and they all relate to the same fact that you cut your code into modular pieces, into functional pieces, and a uh, function should be well-defined on what it's trying to do and why it's trying to do it. Um, and of course, repeating code, functions could be central and could be called from different modules, and uh, therefore, you, mm, that, that's what usually would be the case. Um, so it's not just about maintainability and readability, but also about modularity and not repeating things, not rewriting your code every time. And reusability, of course, the whole world of frameworks and in all languages and in all technologies and all um, mm, programming aspects, uh, use one way or another of functions um, um, in order to separate your, to the work and not to rebuild not to reinvent the wheel every time. So uh, in JavaScript, there are a few ways to declare functions. We'll see, um, we'll see them. Um, actually, today I have a lot of demos which are external to, to additional to the, the demos that are built into the course. Um, I'll show you some JS fiddles um, on some oddities. We'll also talk today about, in connection to functions about scope and about um, closures and about namespaces and we'll go deeper into that into objects because objects in JavaScript are also functions in a way they're not in a way they are functions that's why I mean that's what I mean that actually functions like for example here we have a function a very simple function um, but that's not how, that's not where it ends this is the simple case but that's not where it ends with JavaScript because in JavaScript basically everything is a function the bottom line and we'll see it so uh, how do you declare a function? You um, need to um, use the keyword function. Um, you can give it a name, but you don't have to give it a name. Point number one, you don't have to give your function a name in JavaScript. Um, and then we have the curly braces, which are, which are actually the function's closure or scope. And then you do whatever you want, the function statements, um, calculations, whatever. So uh, the first line is a lie. Not each function has a name in JavaScript, um, but most functions do have a name. Um, and we'll see how we build them and how we call them. So here we have the function name. Yep, again. Then we have the body, which is surrounded by um, these curly braces. Like I, um, unlike I mentioned earlier when we talked about loops and about conditional statements, that you can avoid the curly braces in functions. You cannot avoid the curly braces. You need to put them, otherwise you'll get an error. So no matter how many statements your function has, it has to be uh, surrounded by curly braces. Let's see some. So we are still, uh, again, in our familiar um, environment. This is our HTML here with our 
console CSS and console JS that give us, we'll see it in a second in the browser, it gives us this black square where we can interact by writing, um, writing stuff into it by calling js console dot write line. Um, and we have here a function called print logo. And this is where it starts and this is where it ends. And we have four statements. Each one of those will write a line in its turn. And already we can see the advantage of using functions because if we want to reprint this logo with its four lines, all we have to do is call once this, this call. And we'll have these four lines written for us. Functions should be declared before they're called. So um, basically, they should be on the page when, um, when you're making the call. That's all clear, right? It's very simple. Um, I'm not sure that would work, but um, it might work. Let's try and see. I'm not sure in all circumstances this will work, but we'll put it here and reload the page so it still works. Okay, so um, there are a few ways to define a function. Um, functions actually also declare objects and we'll see it deeper later on today. Um, we'll see what functions can be also used for, but except writing functions like this, where you have the word function and then the name and the brackets and putting these, uh, the body of the function here, functions can also be um, created with uh, constructors. Mm, that's one way to do it. For example, we have here a variable called print. And here we are calling a new and the keyword function. So this is constructing a function object. And here we're putting the code which will go into the function's body as a string. It's not very common to do this, but it's possible. Mm. So this is, for example, a function produces a function that has no name, but assigns it to a variable. So this variable will now point to this function. This is something that exists in other languages in one way or another. In C Sharp, we have delegates, and in C++, we have function pointers. But here, what happens in, C in, in JavaScript is that you can create a function just like that, either through a constructor, as we see here, or without a constructor, as we'll see down here. You can take this, fun uh, this, this function that you just created and assign it to a variable. You can also transfer this variable as a parameter to another function. You can reassign variables between functions. So functions be behave like objects in a way, and they also help us declare objects. We use the constructor. We use the class name function here, the big F. Um, here on the second, uh, on the second. Uh, Mm. Second sample, we see the normal function just like we declared it previously. Um, the fact that it's flattened down to one line doesn't matter. We still have the function keyword, the name, the curly braces, and we have the body here. Um, we didn't put a semicolon here because there's only one statement and it's not mandatory in JavaScript. But uh, if we had more statements, we would need that because they are flattened into one line. And now, down here, we have mm, two options um, of, again, we are declaring a function. Um, I'll start with the, the bottom line, actually, which is pretty similar to what we have here. We're declaring the function by the function keyword with a lowercase f, giving it a name and all that and the body. And we take this thing as it is, and we assign it into a variable. So that's one option to declare the function, give it its own name. So I can actually call print func here, or I can call the print variable here. They will be the same. They will behave like they're the same function. And one line above it, it's almost the same, except that this function doesn't have a name. So I can declare a function with no name at all, just function and putting the brackets immediately and the body. And I take it and I assign it 
to a variable. So this will be my function pointer. I can call print and it will call my function, even though this function is in memory and it is stored as m in my JavaScript code, but it, it cannot be called directly because it doesn't have a name. But the print variable, which is assigned to it, can be used as to point to it. So this is already something that you don't see in other languages uh, most of the time. Um, completely anonymous, nameless functions that can be assigned immediately as variables. Okay? Uh, calling a function, that's the other part that we need to invoke the function that we just wrote. Uh, we need to um, call it in a statement. So we just call the function's name, we put parentheses. If we have uh, the parameters to the function, we'll also talk about function arguments. If, if we don't, we don't need to. And put a semicolon because you're nice people and you put semicolons everywhere. And you're well educated because I'm teaching you to do things right. So you put semicolons because you want me to like you. And this will execute the function's code block. Uh, well, of course, functions can call, them, uh, can call other functions as well. Um, that's what happens most of the time. We have arrays of functions here and there in different modules, different classes, different namespaces, and we usually call from one function to another. And if you're building your code correctly, modularly, um, if you take the model that comes from, for example, C Sharp or C++, okay, we can go back to C++. Everything in C++ is a class. And everything you want to do must be confined with a function. Um, in JavaScript, mm, it, doesn't ha it doesn't work like that. You can put your code right into the page. You don't need functions. But if you build your code correctly with the right modularity, everything will be objects and everything will be functions. So functions usually will call other functions. So um, for example, the print function here is calling a function called log, which is a member function of the console object. But functions, of course, can also call themselves. And you know this if you've ever used any other language, um, what we call recursion. So here is the function called another print that calls the print function first. When the print function finishes its work, it goes to the next statement. And the next statement is actually calling itself so we have a function calling itself, what we call recursion, and developers love this stuff. Yeah. All right with this? Let's see it. OK, so what will happen here? It's the same uh, example. This is the same function that we had before. This is the second function that's called another print. It calls the first function and then calls itself. And what will happen when it calls itself recursively? It will go again. It will call print logo. It will go here. Then it will call itself again endlessly. This is not an endless loop. This is an unstoppable recursion. There is a difference. You understand the difference, right? And you know what will happen eventually. Hmm? No, stack overflow. Buffer overflow is a hacker trick. Um, usually when you go and you want to hack a piece of software, real hackers, I mean not hackers, most hackers in the world, are um, they are divided into two camps. There is the the real, real hackers who are mathematicians and computer scientists, and they know how to take a um, piece of software and reverse engineer it so they can understand the, the initial code of the software. And they know how to find vulnerabilities in that software. For example, if you have a variable, which is a string, which is stored somewhere in memory, this takes a specific buffer in memory. But if you know the limitations of this buffer and you start overriding this string and putting into it something which is bigger from the buffer which you originally allocated, what happens is you are starting to override the initial, s the, the original software code where, while it's running in memory. That's what's called buffer overflow. So you take a bigger buffer than you have 
and you put it onto a smaller buffer so it starts overriding stuff outside the buffer. And that way you can make programs do other stuff that they were actually not meant to do. And that's what a lot of hacking does, or cracking. So this is buffer overflow. When we go to a, a function, usually what happens is we have here a specific closure, a specific area in memory, which gets allocated for this function, for its arguments, for its variables. Everything here is managed in the what we call stack. So every time we call a function, if we call this function here, first of all, it will go here and it will allocate a stack area for this function and its variables. Then we call from here to another function. This one is left in the stack. The stack is a, is a memory, um, the stack is an in-memory um, data structure which saves things and then puts more things into it. And first we have to get rid of the stuff that we added last. It's last in, first out, right? So we have to put into the stack now stuff about this function. We allocate more memory. Then we go back and then we go again into this function. Even though it's the same function again, we are allocating another piece of the stack for it. And then we're going here again. Here we're finishing, we're out. Then we're going again into this one and we're calling itself again. So we are allocating more and more and more into the stack. At some point, um, the browser will run out of stack space and it will probably crash because Windows will not allow it to just allocate endlessly into the stack. And what happens usually when you write programs either in C Sharp, and I can show you a demo in if you write a small console application in C Sharp and we start allocating stack, at some point the program will crash because Windows will say, cut the bullshit, man, and uh, just get out of here. Your stack overflowed already and just leave me alone, you bastard. So that's what Windows will say. Um, here, what happens, because we are confined to the console, we are confined to the, the browser, and we're calling things from within the browser's area of running the JavaScript, which is a interpreter which runs in the background of the browser, probably the browser will crash. The browser will, will, the browser will crash. And let's see. Hmm. It's doing something. Let's see if we can see what's happening. It's so busy right now. Where are? Hmm. We don't have any logs and we don't have any evidence to what's going on. Probably the stack areas are so small and they are hardly used because we're not allocating much, so it could take a while for it. But, and I can't even stop it. The browser, it didn't crash yet, but it's running and it's extremely busy right now. Yeah. Let's do it like this. Um, let's see what happens. Just an experiment. So we had a moment where we could see the UI, and now the browser got stuck in itself, and maybe the JavaScript module in the browser actually crashed, but the, uh, it didn't crash the entire browser yet. But I, I assume that if it continues, it, it should crash the browser at some point. So that's a bad, bad idea, uh, a, a bad example of recursion. Always make sure that your recursions are well-defined, and if you are doing recursions, make sure that your recursion stops somewhere because you'll get a bad results. Either like this or worse, you really will get a crash. Don't ask me about the pictures here. Okay, so far we've seen simple functions. Usually, usually 
you would have functions with parameters, uh, what we call more uh, officially arguments. So you can put uh, zero or several um, input values into the functions. Mm. They have to have names. Of course, in JavaScript, they don't have types. Um, and they you actu actually, in JavaScript, as we will see in a minute, you don't have to even provide those. You don't have to do anything. You have a function. It doesn't need to have a name. You put parameters. You don't need to really send them. You can put more parameters than planned. You can put less parameters than planned. Um, it, it will work. So one way or another. So that's, uh, again, one thing about JavaScript and the way that it handles these things and functions, which is slightly different than what other languages do to handle this. So here, here's an example. Um, of course, parameters do have types, just like any other values in JavaScript, but you don't specify them. So here we have a small um, function. We can see that this function print sign takes an argument, one argument, which is a number. We don't know if it's a number. It's called number. That's just the name. It doesn't mean it has to be really a number. And if it's not a number, it could behave not as expected. We could make sure that the, the function gets really a number by checking it inside the function to see that the variable is correctly put. But otherwise, we don't have control over it. In C sharp, for example, you put a function. And just like any other variable in C sharp, it's typed. And you know that it's expected to be of this specific type. And furthermore, you can have different functions with the same name taking different types. And they will be different. And they can run side by side. Function overloading. We don't have it in JavaScript. We have one function with one um, list of variables. So one we have here, um, the print sign takes a number. And we are checking. We are assuming, since this doesn't have to be a number, but we are assuming now that it's correct and it does have a number, we can check its value. If it's greater than 0, print this. If it's smaller than 0, print this. Otherwise, print 0. And uh, so this behavior of this function will be determined by the argument that we supply to it, assuming that it's the correct type of argument, assuming that it's in the right range that we expect, assuming many things. But these are, this is your job. If you're building functions, you have to build them right, and you have to make sure that they behave correctly, even if somebody calls them not the right way. Here is another function. This one takes two arguments. So this one has number two and number one, or number one and number two, whichever way you, you like it. Um, so they are differentiated by name. But again, we don't know if they match the right type and the right range and everything. So we are trying to see which is the maximum of the two numbers, which is the bigger one. So we assume first it's number one. Then we check if number two is bigger than number one. Then we reassign number the max to number two. So we have an inner variable here that lives only in the confines of this function. That's also some valuable information that we will see later why it's valuable and how how these things actually work from the inside. But I'll just tell you that these, all these variables live in the, in the um, scope of the function between these two curly braces. So number one, number two, and max are three variables that live in, in, this, in this world. Um, we pass values here to number one and number two from the outside. But they are manipulated in here. And once we're out of the function, number one and number two don't have, uh, they are undefined. Okay? So is max. Max is a variable which is defined inside the function. And outside the function, it, has, it is not defined. It's undefined. And then we print out the maxim maximal, I don't know if it's correct to say maximal, maximal, maximum. Max, number. And we say max. Calling functions with parameters, you can pretty much supply any type of uh, value that you can think of. It could be either a number or a string or anything which is hard-coded like this. You can put the name of a variable that you have like this. You can send an expression like here. You can send two numbers. You can send numbers and expressions. And you can 
basically everything will be calculated and uh, evaluated before the function is called and the values that are being s um, sent here will be mm, valid for, for the function. So for example, um, here's our print max. We expect two numbers here. They don't have to be integers, by the way, because numbers, numbers in JavaScript, as I mentioned, are all floating point numbers, basically. They are just sometimes rendered as, as uh, whole numbers. Um, I showed you the audit, uh, odd numbers, right? Um, and calculations that sometimes can get screwed up. I'll show it to you in a second again, if you want. So here we are. What we're sending is another variable called old quantity times 1.5. This will get calculated. This will get assigned to number one. And this value will be used inside the function as number one. So this is a variable for the scope of the function, even though it's constructed by this expression. Same for this expression, quantity times two. And this will be first evaluated and then sent to the function as number two. Now we have as if we have a variable called number two with this, the value of this calculation. All clear? Let's see it. Um, before I go to see it, no, don't restore. Uh, Not this, this. Maybe here, just a second. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to show you again this fiddle. Mm, yeah, so I, I built a small uh, page here. Um, and every time you click a button, it will evaluate the expression uh, uh, on the button. Um, just to show you. So for example, um, to show you how weird sometimes uh, and how inaccurate JavaScript numbers can be because just in relation to what I just showed you. So for example, 0 plus 1 plus 0 plus 2 is 0 0.3 blah, 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 4. Why? I don't know. But if you take 0 plus 1 plus 0 plus 2 and put it in brackets and then assign to 0 plus 3 to 0 0.3, we'll get 0 0.6, blah, 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 1. And then, but if we put the brackets here, then we get 0 0.6. Great. Success. Um, rounding numbers, for example. So that's rounding them down, removing the floor. Um, this is rounding them up. Um, um, but then we have um, another number, which is rounded up automatically because it's below 0 0.5 in the end and then it could be rounded up again and this i showed you that you can take a number and you can do a bitwise or that would work um, it's just cutting out because it gets it casted into 32-bit number but it wouldn't work on numbers beyond 32 bits because it gets casted to 32-bit numbers so if you do it on numbers that take more than 32 bits you might get um, the wrong answer. So these numbers are almost the same, but you can see that they are not behaving correctly when we cut out. OK, that, uh, that's not related to that demo, but I wanted to show this just to, sh to recap on numbers and their odd behaviors, which is also something you should take into account. Um, let's first see the UI. So here we have two text boxes and two links and mm -hmm. the HTML. Oh, excuse me. Again, ep epileptic people leave the classroom. Um, so here we have a button that says on print sign button click, which, uh, okay, the, the first button has this text, print sign, and when we click it, we invoke a function, which is, 
this one down here. So this function will read the number from the text box. We'll get it, uh, uh, cast it to a floating point number, which is put into a variable called number. And then we call the method print sign, which gets a number as an argument. And that's what we saw actually uh, in, the, in the slide. It will check the number and we'll put the right text. Then we have um, a text box here that says print max. And when we click on it, it will invoke the on print button max, on print max button click, which is this function. This will read the numbers, multiple numbers in which you've put in the text box into an array of numbers. And then it will call the print max function, which gets an array of numbers. And it will go over the array, scanning it with a for loop from zero to the array length. And we'll check which is the max number. We start from zero. And we check if we have a number greater than zero and we go on like this to find the maximum. Of course, if we, find, if we put all numbers which are negative, um, the max will become probably zero because none will be greater here. Um, yeah, basically, oh, sorry, that's wrong. What we actually do I is we find the number, the index of the biggest number. So we're starting from zero. So that will actually work for all numbers. So we are finding the bigger number by comparing the number at the biggest index found so far to the number at the current index counter. And when we find it, we adjust the maximum counter index position. And once we're done with this, we're printing out the max number is in, um, the, this is the max number in this array. Is this clear? Not so much. Nope. This, this, the way this function works. An array of numbers. And this will be the index of the greatest number in the array. So we start from zero, which is the first point in the array. And we assume that that's the biggest number. Then we scan the array from zero, which actually we could, no, we have to start from zero uh, up to the full length of the array. And then we check if the number in the current point i is bigger than the so far biggest number that we found in max index position. And if it is, we update the max index to be the current index. So after all this loop is uh, finished, the max index will be the position of the greatest number in the array. And then we say, OK, this then we go to the array and say at this index, we extract the number at this index. We say the max number in the array that we're printing out with the join and comma. Hmm? Yeah, I'll show it to you. Uh, well, let's run the code and I'll show it to you how it runs. So here's our source. I'll put, I'll put a breakpoint here, and I'll put a breakpoint here. So let's start with the first function. Mm. Yeah. First function will get whether the current number is 0, positive, or negative. So when I put the number and I click print sign, the right function will be called. So we're now in the breakpoint and the debugger. We got the number 5 here. And we are in the function. So we're checking if the number is greater than 0. This will give us true right now, because that's, that's actually true. And then we'll print out the number is positive, And we're finished. If I put a negative number, then we're going to the same function again. This time it's minus 5. So the first expression will be evaluated to false, so we'll skip it. Now we're here checking if it's smaller. This evaluates the true, so we'll print this, and we're finished. So this is pretty simple, okay? Let's see how this one works. 
let's say one, two, five, three. So when we go into this function, first we read these numbers into an array. That's easy because we can take them with the, with the commas and then we do an array split and we'll get a uh, string split. We'll get an array of all the numbers. So here is the array right now. Mm. Why is it like this? Hmm, something is wrong. With, uh, separated by comma. Okay. Let me see just a second. Let's go to this number, to this function, see what happens. So we have a function called read array. Ah, separator is undefined. Okay. So we read the text. And separator is undefined. Okay, we got a bug. Just a second. Let's try something. Okay, so if I add the separator here, let's try this again. Oh, sorry. Sorry about all this moving around. Okay, so now with the separator, we get an array of all the numbers, as we should, and we're calling the print max function. So this is how we start. We have an array with all our function. The array has four elements. We can see the size. And currently, we assume the max index is zero because we'll, we'll assume the biggest number is in place zero. So we go with the i counting from zero to length, which is four. So we'll go zero, one, two, three. The first index is i, 0. We're checking whether this number, which is in 1, is greater than this number it's not. Then we'll move on. And we'll keep updating our max index every time. Right now we are on place 3, so the last one. No, almost the last one. So the max index uh, is 2, which is the third number in my list. So that means the greatest number is in place 2. So that's number 5, is the max in my array, which will be printed out. Well, it's, hmm. That's the output. So we are scanning all the numbers and every time saving where the biggest number was found. I can go into this again, but I think it's pretty, pretty okay, right? The way it works. Okay, um, another example of uh, printing um, different triangles by different uh, sizes, given arguments. So uh, what we can do is <coughs> We have a function called print line that prints a line in a specific uh, length, um, starting from a specific index and to a specific counter. So what we have here, we're uh, reading a specific number called n, which is uh, assumed to be an integer number. And then we have a loop that goes and increments every time um, the variable called line, starting from 1 till n. So if we have 3, it will be 1, then 2, and then 3. And we are printing a line in size 1, line in size 2, line in size 3. Then we're starting again from n minus 1, 
going counting back down to one. So we have two for loops. One is incrementing and the other is decrementing. And that way we can print those lovely triangles, starting with the row at the size one, then row at the size two, then row at the size three, then row at size four, and so on. When we're finished with the first for loop, we're starting the second for loop, which starts counting back from four to, to one. And it, it only prints line, which means it prints with another for loop, the numbers counting from one to the number that we've reached so far. So first it will print one, then it will print one and two, then print one, two, and three, and so on. And that's how we get this pattern. So we could basically, um, once we have a different number n, this will affect the size of these two, three, four loops actually, and the way that they increment and decrement. Too complicated or simple? It's simple enough, or I hope. Yeah, well, let's try it. Let's hope there's no bug here. So again, the source, the simple function prints a line of numbers from start to end. So we're starting a for loop from the first number that we give, and we're counting to the last number that we give, and it just prints all the numbers in this range by calling a for loop, and every time calling Jake, uh, the console right with a space. And here we have the button that we click that gets the number n, that will be our base number for the triangles, first for loop will increment from one to the number that we've collected. So it will be first a line in, um, a line in size one, then a line of size two, then a line of size three, and so on. Once we're finished with this, we're incrementing. We're building another for loop, which takes the number that we reached minus one. So we'll start from five. Now we have, let's say, four. And we're decrementing in every iteration. And again, printing the lines then it will be 1, 2, 3, 4, then 1, 2, 3, then 1, 2, and then 1. And the way this looks is this. Mm. Do you understand how it works? Pretty much. It's just a bunch of loops that print out numbers in a range, start and end. So start from, they o we always start from one. You see all the calls to print line are actually starting from one. So the first number in this loop will be one. So here we're starting from one and printing the numbers from one to whatever number we give. One, two, three, four, five, whatever. The point is that we're calling print line every time with one and the range increases because the number here, which we call line, is our loop counter. So every time we iterate our loop, we increment the line. So we get a bigger and bigger line printed out. Line is just a collection, uh, is just a sequence of numbers. Okay? Okay, if Tveti says it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, if she can, yeah, if she can understand it, everybody can. Uh, okay, <coughs> another important uh, aspect of, uh, another important part of the functions is the arguments object. Like I mentioned, you cannot start building um, overloaded functions and you cannot build functions with different numbers of parameters or different behaviors according to different parameters. Uh, we will have to rely only on a single function that will have to carry on on different conditions. Um, there, every function has this object um, given to her by the framework, which is called um, arguments, just like with the uh, other built-in objects like document, which allows you to interact with your HTML document. Every function has um, an object called arguments, and arguments is an array 
or behaves like an array which um, shows you which parameters were passed to the function. So, for example, here's a function called print arguments. And as you can see, the signature of the function says that it doesn't expect any, any variables. I mean, at least not explicitly. But you could call this function, calling the name, and providing, for example, four different arguments, variables or values or whatever you choose to send. This, um, this uh, object called arguments will contain all the values that have been transformed to the function. Even if here we don't really expect one, you could transfer it and you could check inside the function what was really sent to it. So there shouldn't, there doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one match between um, the list of arguments in the function and the actual uh, arguments that you really send to the function. And vice versa, this could be a, no a function that expects arguments, but let's say that you're not sending any or you're sending less than what was stated here. That will also work. But the arguments, uh, the arguments value here will be containing different values in, uh, according to what you actually send. So here's an example. Okay, so here's a function called print argument. Here it, we have two calls to it. And here's the function itself. So by default, this function has in the signature, it doesn't expect any arguments to be sent to it at all. But we have two cases here where we're sending um, two different sets of arguments. So what we do, we print uh, this separator um, when we first enter and when we exit, just to have some separator in the output log. Um, we can see different uh, mm, properties of the arguments. Um, so what, uh, what we have here mostly is that we're going through the arguments in a for in loop, and we're printing out the arguments of this um, function. And the callee, which is actually giving us uh, more information about the function, let's see it, let's see it printed out, it will be more clear. So this one doesn't output to the console here. You can see that it outputs to console.log, which means this will be um, visible in our dev tools. Let's clear it and refresh. OK. So um, the callee, as I mentioned, uh, is this part, this uh, property of the argument. It is uh, information about the function that was actually called. And what you can see as the output of this is that it prints out the actual function, just prints it out as a string, because it gets um, casted to a string to be outputted to the log. Basically, it's the function object. And here, we are printing out the arguments that were sent to the function. So what we're doing here, we're going with a for loop with all the arguments, with i, which gives us the iterator, the enumerator, and we're printing out arguments i, which means we're just iterating through all the arguments that were sent to this function and printing them out. So the output of this is first the function itself, which is printed by arguments.callee, and then each time we log out the argument that was sent to it. So we can see that it ran five times here. Then the second time we call the function, we see the same result. This is the function. But here, for example, we can see that uh, the first argument was an array of numbers, and it's printed out. It's not printed out. It's actually casted out here. We can see its properties. And then the second is a string, which ca gets casted here. Then we have some object that we can see mm, information about it. Then we have a date here. So all this information, regardless of the fact that this was actually not declared in the function itself, we can call it. And then we can make our function behave the way we want according to the arguments that were sent to it. You can check uh, arguments 
the length of the arguments, you can go through them and see what type each one of them is, and then you can work accordingly. So if you have a function that gets sometimes a string, sometimes a number, sometimes a floating point, sometimes a name, you can sometimes three names, you can make it behave properly according to the arguments dynamically. That's uh, valuable, and, and this thing doesn't work like this in other languages, because other languages are not so permissive, like C sharp. They demand a specific function signature with specific types, with specific numbers, but you can have overload. You can have three functions with the same name that will behave completely differently with different signatures. In JavaScript, there is no overload. We'll see this in a second. What you need to do is analyze the arguments that are being sent to your function yourself, like this. Before we, to, we talk about this, uh, we'll talk about returning values. So in many cases, functions will do something and then will return some value to the caller of the function. Um, of course, it can be of any type. Um, and if, if you have no value returned, um, then the caller will get an undefined if you try to assign something to it. So if we have a function here that we're calling, and we take the value returned from the function and we are assigning it to the variable here. Um, here what happens is that we are calling the function, getting the return value, putting it in this um, calculated um, mm, expression and we take the value and put it into this variable. And here we take an array and we sort it but then this will not return a value, it will just change the array, sort it and not return anything, so we will not have any value here. Um, if you want to return something at any point in your function, just use the return keyword and whatever value you want to return to be the function to, to be sending out. Uh, of course, once you do this, um, the function stops running. So if you have any code below this point, um, it, will be not, it will not be reached. But, of course, the function can have multiple return points. Personally, I like a function that returns in a single point. I think it's good practice that every function will have one point of return. It's more readable. It's more debuggable. Even if you have some complex calculations and you've reached some kind of uh, calculation before that and you don't want to go on, put your function in a, in a structure that gets conditional statements and get to the right condition, do the right calculation, and then bypass all the rest, but then at the bottom of the function get to a single return point. Because multiple returns sometimes get into spaghetti and you don't know when the function is actually going to return and following up on code like this can be uh, more confusing. So usually I would support as least the least possible return points to a function because if a function suddenly returns in the middle, it's not always intuitive and it's not always easy to follow. Um, so take it as a good practice. Um, if you don't specify anything, you just write the, the return statement, it will still terminate the function, but um, return nothing. So like I mentioned, it can be in multiple um, places in the mm, function body um, to return different values for different cases and so on and so forth. Uh, Just a little more on this. So this function uh, gets an object of any kind, any type of object that can be traversed. Uh, we have a counter which is declared in the function it goes through the properties of the uh, object that we are sending, regardless of what type of object it is, and incrementing the counter. So once it's done looping here, you want to change the temperature? Is it too hot? Switch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, 
we're looping through all the properties of the object with a simple for in loop and all the public properties of this object sent here. We're incrementing the counter. Once we're done looping and looping and looping and incrementing, we got a number here, which is the count, which uh, um, counts how many properties this object has, and it will return this number out to the caller. So here we have a write line, and instead of writing a value, we are calling a function inside it. So first, this function will be called, first sending the document object, which is available to um, your JavaScript in the browser, then doing the same thing with the navigator object. So it will count how many properties are available for the document object, how many properties are available for the navigator object, and it will print out these two numbers one after the other. And that's the result. It's a good result, you have to admit. All right, simple enough, right, so far. Uh, okay, here's um, another example, pretty similar to, almost similar to what we just saw. Um, we take numbers, okay, which is expected to be um, a collection of numbers, an array, and we have a sum that we're starting from zero, and we have a loop, again, looping through all the numbers in, our, in the collection that we're providing here. For each of these numbers, we are checking whether this number is even. If it means that if you divide it by two, you will have zero remainder. That's what's doing. That's what this, this if is doing. If we find a number that complies with this um, condition, we add it to the sum. So we calculate the sum of all the even numbers in the array, looping, 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 finish the loop, going through all the numbers. Then we have the calculated sum here, and we return it. One more thing that I want to specify here. Um, the sum up here, as I mentioned, this is variable is declared in the scope of this function. So it would be good that if you have variables inside your function that are mm, used in your function like this, declare them usually, it would be good to declare them at the top of the function like this so that any user of the function will know which variables are being used inside. Again, debuggability, readability, maintainability, all kinds of ability words are good here. Um, so this function is well structured. It has a sum. It has the body of whatever it tries to do, and it has one return value here, return statement under all this. Of course, if you have a more spaghetti function with different areas and ifs and whatever and counts and loops, you can start defining sub variables inside those other blocks of code inside your function and your inner, inner parts of the function. I wouldn't recommend it unless you have a very good reason to structure it like that. Put the variables on top, get your arguments, do whatever you need to do, and if you have a return, if you need to return something, return in one point, usually at the bottom of the function would be good, good place for this. Yeah, okay, this, this comment here just it states that if you want to calculate that the number is even, you can do numbers, well, like it says, number, uh, the number at place i, if you divide it by two, gives a zero, or if it's not false, because like we've seen previous times, many times, the condition of if that is equivalent to false in JavaScript can be false, empty string, zero, null, undefined, anything like that would be sufficient as a true or, or false condition. So here we say, if numbers, if you divide by two, you get the remainder in division by two. If it's not zero, meaning that it's not false. So we have this not in this. So if this thing will return zero, it will be traversed to true because it will be reversed with, the, with this not. Just a little trick. So this one. Aha, uh -huh. here they put the separator, good. 
OK, so here is what we do. We have a button, some even numbers. That's the text. Then on click, we call this function. Here it is here. Collect all the numbers that are in the text box into an array, and then call some numbers. And when you get a result, print it out to the console. That's the flow. When we call this function, again, we get the sum starting from 0 here, up here. And when we're done calculating, return down here. That's fine. And we're going through the numbers, all the numbers in the array. The i is our iterator, going with the 4 in. And every time we go, we check the number in the place in the index i, checking that if we divide by 2, what would be the remainder? If it's equal to 0, which means it's an even number. And then we increment it, uh, add it to the sum. I like examples that are easy to explain. So let's put some uh, 9, 5, 2, 10, 8, 7, 9. Mm. Oh, great. I'm happy with. Yes? Now we got 10. Yeah. Are you saying my, my code is buggy? <laughs> <coughs> OK, I mentioned it already, but this is an important uh, part um, to, to, to notice. And we'll talk a little more later about closures with some tricks, um, tricks with closures and functions. Um, but um, like I mentioned, there are everything you define in your function is alive inside your function. Um, and what we see here is that we have a variable which is outside all the functions and all the objects. It's called error, and it's an array. Um, so this should be available pretty much everywhere. But any variable that you declare inside your function will be available only in the function. So what we see here is that we have a counter inside the function, but we are also referencing the array which is outside the function. Um, you should know that anything you declare inside the function, or basically in every block in JavaScript, um, is re relevant and alive and um, defined only in the block where you put it. Because this is also valuable in other scenarios with, where you have much more complex um, code blocks and you should know what's available where. That's the whole um, trick of cl closures and scopes in JavaScript. We'll see more deeper examples of we on this later. OK, just like I mentioned, the R is their global scope array. It's accessible pretty much everywhere. Um, and we can reference it from within the function. We have the count, which is declared inside the function, so it should not be available outside the function. Mm. Yeah, um, that's also um, yeah, something that we'll see also later when we talk about objects, but um, the word var here is actually the one that declares it as a local variable. But uh, we'll, we'll try to ch change it now, and we'll see. We'll talk about this more when we see objects, but hmm. so the same scenario. Here's the array, and here's the function, just counting mm, from 0 going through the array length with a for loop. And basically finds, so uh, what, what we're trying to find here is a specific value in the array, if it is found and how many times it's found. So for example, we're sending here a value. 
we count, count the currencies mm, with the number three, it will search the array for all the occurrences of the number three and will count how many times it occur appears there. So our counter starts from zero. We're passing through the array from zero to the length. And if the array at this point, the object in the array is equal to the value that we sent, then we increment the counter. It'll be better to, re to be written like this. Once we're done traversing, we're returning the count. So what happens here is that we are calling the function with three and finding how many times three appears in the array. We get the value returned and we print it out. And what we're trying to print out here is the variable called count. But since this one doesn't appear outside the function, this should not be defined outside and what we should get here is an undefined string. We got an empty string, I think. Ah, we got a row. Yeah, we got an error. <coughs> okay. So the second call here failed because we're trying to reference a variable that doesn't exist. Um, however, if we don't put the var here, um, I think I might have mentioned previously that, let's see it in this, uh, I want to show you here in the console for a second. So I can declare uh, I can declare variables in JavaScript with a with a keyword var. So I can do something like like this. So this statement doesn't return any value, so we get an undefined. But right now I have a variable called x, and it is assigned. And here's the value one. However, I can assign variables since everything is allowed in JavaScript. You can do whatever you want. You don't need even to use the word var. You can use a variable and assign it immediately without even using the word var at all. So we got a return value here, and now we have a variable called p with a value. Okay? What I want to show you here is that previously, if we use the word var inside the scope of a function or an uh, object, this means that this um, variable is defined here, and it's alive only in the scope of the function in this case, a function. However, if I remove the word var, th yes, why? Because, first of all, this is still a valid statement. You're not declaring a variable, but you're implicitly declaring a variable, and you're saying variable count is equal to zero. Since this one is not declared in the function, JavaScript assumes that this variable, it will automatically create it and assign a value to it, and since I didn't use var, it's not a new declaration, and this will be available also outside. It will declare it um, implic ex implicitly, but it doesn't know where this one is coming from. So it will be treated as a global variable, and will be assigned, and will have a value, and it will be valid. So if we remove the word var here, and we reload the page, then we'll get two times printed the number, okay? One time, um, yeah, one time here for the return value, which actually returns count, and then we print out count, but since count was actually mm, declared here, it's the same number printed twice. Is this okay? It's tricky. And there's more trickiness to it. I'll show you some more stuff about closures in later. OK, function overloading, like I mentioned, doesn't exist in JavaScript. You have one function with one um, signature. And you should uh, make your function behave in a way that um, you expect it, de depending on the different uh, arguments. 
So here, for example, we have two functions called print, but function number two will actually override the function number one. It's a redeclaration of a function with the same name. It will be overridden. There is no overloading. These two cannot live um, side by side. So that's something to, to note. Quickly showing it. So here we have two functions. No, we have. Mm. Actually, we don't have an overloading here. We have a function called console print and print. That's correct. I assume this was changed, probably for a previous demo that I made. But, <coughs> OK. So here we have one that's called print and one that's called print, uh, one with one variable and one with two variables. Uh, one prints the w number, and the other one prints number in text. Um, so if we call this function, actually, we should have two lines for each of the calls, because basically the second function should be called, not the first one. So um, if I now save it and reload it, OK, what we got is four lines, two lines for the first call and two lines for the second call here. First, we're calling it with five, but with no other argument. It will still call this function, not this function, even though the signature matches the, this one. And it will print the two lines. And the second argument is undefined, so we'll get an undefined for it. then the first one will override. If I reverse them, now we got only one line for each call. And the second argument is just ignored. Yes, because it's an overload, override, not overload. So you cannot do real overloading. You have to fake it. You have to fake it by different ways. You, have, you can check the number of parameters by checking the arguments. Of, uh, you can check the types of parameters. You can have optional parameters like we saw now. So if you have a, number, uh, a function that expects two arguments, you can still send it just one argument. You can send it four arguments. So everything you do, you can uh, overload and you can fake the overload by uh, checking what parameters are sent to the function. So here, for example, we have a function that gets number in text. And then we have checking the argument's length with a switch case. So if we have just one argument, we'll print just the one. If we have two arguments, we'll print the two. So in that case, this one will behave differently with different arguments. And it will look like it has an overload, but it really doesn't. So that's one way of faking it by number of parameters. Quickly see it. Okay, so mm, just a little bit uh, tricky structure here because what we have here is a function in a function. But if you ignore this for a second, <laughs> um, what we have here is a character counter function that gets a string and a character and whether the case sensitive is um, set. So basically, what we check is the number of arguments. Uh, you see that the function starts here and ends down here. But inside the function, there are two other functions. This, that's perfectly legal and OK in JavaScript to do this. Um, so these functions will be just like other variables and other objects in JavaScript. They'll be available in the scope of the function. Um, sometimes, let's say you want to do this, especially when we talk about objects, like later. And so we're checking now what arguments the main function has received, either two or three. And according to that, we call one of the inner functions, if it's case sensitive or not. So um, 
<coughs> if you specified only two, so you specify the string and the character to find the count for, if this argument is not specified, we have only two arguments, then we just call get character count insensitive, which is mm, this function that will just count it insensitively. If you specify three arguments, then we check whether this thing is set to true or not. And if it's true, that means that we um, want to be case sensitive and we'll call get char count case sensitive. Otherwise, we'll call this function. So it's a little bit complex structure inside, but basically this function, get character count, um, can behave okay with either two or three arguments and it will do what it needs to do. So here's a string from the bacon ipsum and we're running a few checks. You can see that sometimes the calls are with two arguments, sometimes with three, and we're just printing out how many characters are this and how many characters are that with, for example, the letter M that is different count with sensitive or insensitive, but we can just call the function as we want. And as a result, we get this list saying the different counts of letters. So M here appears five times, but if we call it case sensitive, it will be just one. Uh, the other way, uh, another way that you can inspect which parameters are being sent to your function dynamically is to check what type they are. So you can also check, for example, here we have a value and we want to behave differently if we have a different value. So it could be a number or a string or an object. So we have a switch case here on the type of the value that was sent to the function. And according to that, we'll be printing out different, different results. So we are logging different strings for different results. So if we're calling this function with different types, it will behave differently as well. So that's another way to do that. I'm running a little bit ahead because these samples are pretty simple and we need to move on. But stop me if you, if you need to ask something, of course. So here is again the special print function that gets a value. And the first thing it does is it does a switch case. What is the type of value returning? If we get a number, then we are printing out the word number and the value. If we get a string, so on and so forth. If it's a Boolean, so we can inspect the value and the type of the parameter that is being sent by type of and printing out and behaving differently according to that. Mm, even if you are sending null or even if you are sending undefined or if you're not sending anything. So this way you can actually overload functions, not really overload, but make your function behave differently with different arguments and different types. It's not pretty. And usually what I would recommend is not to build such functions that behave differently with different arguments because they are inconclusive and they are undeterm undeterministic. Mm, it's not like in C sharp where you have different functions for different behaviors. This is one function that behaves differently in different cases. So I would suggest build one function for a different case. And if you have other cases, don't start overloading and doing like this because this is, this is a mess. But it's possible. So the outputs, every time we call the function, we get a completely different output by the mm, content that was analyzed. Printing out a number, printing out a string, printing out a Boolean value, an array, an object. So it's possible, but it's not pretty. One last thing about function overloading, you can, uh, um, you can um, declare parameters as, uh, with their default value. So for example, if somebody calls the substring function, but they didn't uh, specify start, the start variable at all, you can check this and you can do an or condition, um, an or logical um, mm, expression with zero. That means that if start is null or undefined, then we'll take this value here. So that's why we put or here, or takes the value which is not false. If we have true or false, it will take the true, right? 
So if here the start is undefined or now, which actually denotes in JavaScript to false, we will take this value. So if nobody sends any start, if this variable was not specified, it will be initialized here to zero. And if nobody specified anything for end, then we'll take the string length by default. So we can set default parameter values here inside the function in case nobody really specified them. And that's a good technique to do it because if end actually has a value, it will take the value. If it doesn't have a value, this will become false. Why is this happening? And we'll take the string length ins uh, instead. So. Oh, it's a good demo. What do we see? Mm. We're checking if a string contains a specific value in a specific range. So we get a string and a specific value in the string and the start and end where to start scanning the string. But if we don't specify um, anything, uh, not a string, in this case an array, okay. But if we don't specify start and end or we specify one of them, these will get initialized here first and then we'll take the values as default. Again, something that comes naturally in C Sharp, here you have to take care of it manually. So that's the output, that's great. Okay, um, that's about functions. We'll continue talking about functions after we take a break because objects are actually um, behaving as functions or functions are actually behaving as objects in JavaScript. So we'll get into objects in a minute or a few minutes and we'll continue with this.